have an accent and it's going to be uh, a little difficult for some of you to um, follow. I'll try and speak slowly and uh, hopefully you can uh, follow what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, yesterday, uh, Yen and I celebrated our 34th wedding anniversary. So it was uh, a really, really nice time. <clears throat> uh, interesting that number 34. Uh, I know uh, there are, none of you are, are particularly superstitious, so uh, uh, those numbers uh, probably don't have much significance, but a lot of Chinese uh, uh, attach significance to numbers and uh, three, four or some C uh, has uh, has some significance to, to some people. Uh, the number four is one that a lot of people avoid. Uh, it is um, significant of death. And uh, so they won't have any uh, uh, special occasions on the fourth of the month and those sort of things. The number three, or well, some, is sort of its opposite in a way. It's about life and success. Uh, so uh, 34 uh, as a time to perhaps reflect on living and dying and uh, that's the, uh, the the topic I want to cover today with this exhortation living and dying it's um, I'll, I'll be focusing probably a bit more on the dying side of it we talk a lot in church about how we need to live our lives uh, and how how um, God lives with us and, and, and through us and helps us to minister. Today, even though living and dying is really inseparable because one can't be had without the other, they go together. But uh, today I want to just talk about uh, a bit more about dying, but in the context of living. Now, Brother Anthony over there said, uh, I should smile a bit more as I, uh, as I deliver my exhortation. I don't think he was quite aware of the subject that I was going to cover today. It's sort of, hard to, it's sort of a serious subject, but I'll try and, uh, try and fit in a few smiles and, and a few light, light-hearted side of it. <clears throat> We, uh, we seem to have a rather morbid fascination with death. It's a central theme of a large proportion of the TV shows and movies. Um, Hollywood's determined that it must also be associated with ever increasing doses of explicit violence, blood and gore. For those of us in our senior years, death is seemingly just over the horizon. So it's more frequently on our minds. We're not necessarily anxious about death, but we feel we need to be prepared for it. For those of you of the younger generation, death is largely irrelevant. Life is here for living, and the prospect of death seems a long way off. While death may be stalking, there are, they are confident that their vitality and sense of destiny will outwit it. Now there's something to be said for this, this optimism. I expect that based on my own experience, which surely isn't all that different to your experience, uh, that we can each look back on near death experiences in our lives, near misses in a car accident, uh, an illness that nearly finished us off, uh, an accident on an adventure somewhere. You'll each have your own story, but I think each of you will think back to a time where, gosh, I could have died there and, and God rescued me. Uh, God had something in store for me. So this, this um, optimism of the young really has some, something behind it, I think. The fact that you're here today and can talk about it means you've survived, you're survivors. This last year though, 2022, seems to have been a year wherein there have been many more people than usual in my intimate circle that have passed on. 
seemingly every month brought news of another family member, friend or colleague dying. May was particularly difficult for us with the passing of my father, who was 92 years old, and of Yen's father, who was 81, within 12 days of each other. This sadness is heightened by the fact that we didn't have any assurance that either of our fathers were going to enjoy eternal life with God. COVID has also brought a focus on death, with fatalities associated with COVID regularly reported in the daily news. It's become easier for us to view these simply as statistics rather than as persons with family and friends left grieving in their wake. We all aspire to an honourable death and hopefully a painless one where we are comforted by our family and friends. But honour in death will come from the way we live our life. Isaiah 57 verse 2 tells us that those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. The value we put on our life. We put a high value on a person's life. We will go to extraordinary lengths to preserve a person's life, including through multiple medical procedures and even organ transplants. We tend to do whatever we can within our financial capacity to sustain or extend life or to postpone death. And generally, with the exception of tyrants and people that we associate with evil, we value the lives of others as much as we value our own lives. There are many people here within FBC who have dedicated their lives to helping others, to making sure that they can have the longest life they can. I salute each of you who are doing that. I see doctors, I know there are people working in aged care, nurses here. I salute you all. I acknowledge the calling that you've taken up and the great work that you are doing. There can also be situations where our life is threatened because of our stand on principle, in particular our adherence to our religious beliefs then we must decide if our life is more valuable than those beliefs. We have the historical examples from the Bible of Daniel willing to be cast into the lion's den, of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego prepared to be thrown into the fiery furnace, of Stephen stoned to death and of the 12 apostles, all of whom submitted to a painful, tortuous death rather than deny their saviour and there, there there is the example of christ himself who submitted to crucifixion because he valued our lives more than his own these examples challenge us as to the depth of our faith we must ask ourselves the question how will i respond when faced with the choice of death or denial of my saviour Standing here today, it's fairly easy to say and put my hand up and say, I would not deny my saviour. But faced with the actual situation, I don't know. I pray that I will have that courage. I pray that my faith will be strong enough. Our ability to offer up our life will ultimately be a product of the strength of our personal relationship with our God. In Mark chapter 8, verse 35 to 37, Jesus says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. This is the divine paradox that confuses the world but it's very clear to us. 
we must be prepared to lose our life for the sake of the gospel if we are to save our eternal life with God. Jesus goes on. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Your life is valuable, but your soul is more valuable. Do not sell your soul to save your life. Rather, be prepared to give up your life, if need be, in order to save your soul. Now I want to talk about a painful death. One of our real nightmares regarding death is that we may be subject to intense and or unremitting pain in the process of dying. This may be due to sickness or injury, or it may be inflicted on us by others as torture or persecution. For myself, I know that when I have to endure even mild levels of pain, I am quickly convinced that the end is nigh. Yet I know people who live with chronic pain and I really admire their stoicism and fortitude. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, wrote this. Pain is unmasked, unmistakable evil. Every man knows that something is wrong when he is being hurt. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. That is not to say that our pain is a measure of our wickedness. Rather, it's a reminder of our ultimate dependence on God. When you're in pain and you can't do anything about it, you know that you no longer have control in your life. You are totally dependent. When everything's going well, we tend to forget that we need God. Some of us will die painful deaths. There's no getting around that. On the matter of dealing with our pain, C.S. Lewis has only this to say. Nor have I anything to offer my readers except my conviction that when pain is to be borne, a little courage helps more than much knowledge. A little, a little human sympathy more than much courage and the least trace of the love of God more than all. Paul speaks on the subject of his own personal suffering in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. He goes on to show how God used suffering in his life to give him insight and make him a better person. 2 Corinthians 12, he says, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I do believe that the only thing that can sustain us in suffering 
is the love of God. And his promise that my grace is sufficient for you. What will it be like to face a cruel or painful death? I hope I never need to know. But we know of many people who have faced death with courage in remarkable circumstances. By God's strength and grace, we also can overcome. A lonely death. I think one of the things that enables people to face death bravely is the strength of relationship. A hero will lay down his life on the battlefield because he knows that he's fighting on behalf of his family and his community. But even more, that he has given his fellow combatants a better chance of being victorious. He believes in the cause and the camaraderie supports him in his effort, even to death. In John 15, Jesus makes the statement, Greater love has no man than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. While death is inherently tragic, it is certainly more bearable with your friends, family, loved ones to support and comfort you. Dying alone, unknown, uncared for, unloved, is horrible to contemplate. Jesus' death was tragic. It is certain, no, not just for the injustice and the cruelty of it, but far more that for the separation from his father at the time of his death. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? were the words that Jesus cried at his death. Jesus took our sins upon himself and paid our price with his life. God the Father, the Holy One, could not be joined with sin. And the total relationship that Jesus and his Father enjoyed had to be broken to accommodate the bearing of our sin on the innocent man, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. From Jesus' cry on the cross, it's clear that this was the greatest regret of his sacrifice for us. He died separated from his Father. There is tragedy in death, but even greater tragedy in death that is alone where there is a sense of abandonment, where relationship is absent. A number of years ago, when our boys Meshach and Simeon, who uh, many of you may remember, uh, were still teenagers, we were holidaying in Marimbula in New South Wales. It was a day after Australia Day and the beach patrols were finished for the year, but it was our only chance for a swim. The weather was good and the waves beckoned. I let the boys go in with their boogie boards, but they soon came back saying that the undertow was quite strong. It appeared that there was a sandbar about 20 metres out, so I suggested that if they could get past the strong undertow and get out to the sandbar, they'd probably be okay. They tried again, but the cross tow pulled them parallel with the beach and into the rip where the concentrator flow washed back out past the rock spit. They tried to catch a wave to come back into shore and after a few attempts, Meshach caught one that landed him on the beach. Simeon, however, missed it and was getting pulled further out to sea. I knew that Meshach was a good swimmer, so I asked him to go back in and see if he could get Simeon. However, things were looking bleak and I was extremely concerned for Simeon, trapped out in the rip all on his own and gradually being pulled out into ever deeper water. Now, I myself am not a strong swimmer. I've never taken to any form of water sports. I knew there was little that I could do to help. Indeed, I know all the tragic stories about the rescuer being ended up drowned while the person in trouble ends up 
surviving. So why did I go into the water and swim out into the rip? There was only one thought that motivated me, a situation that I could not, would not tolerate. That is that my son would face death on his own while I watched from the beach. I really thought there was a high probability that we might drown, but I was determined that we would face it together and he wouldn't be facing it alone. I managed to swim out to him and we clung to the boogie board and tried to manoeuvre our way out of the rip there was no panic, but there also appeared to be no way out. We were still moving out to sea. Praise God that there were some surfers nearby who saw our predicament and paddled out to us on their surfboards. They rescued us, bringing us in one at a time. I was extraordinarily, extraordinarily grateful for their efforts. We survived, but I learned something about death. Death can be painful, tragic, wasteful, but it can also be lonely. We can bear with many of the former if we do not have to endure the latter. Oh, let me not die alone, forgotten, uncared for. One of the wonderful things that Mother Teresa in Calcutta did was she established a home for the dying. At that time in, in Calcutta, she saw that there were people cast out into the streets to die alone, just left there as, as litter. She made the effort. She brought these people in made them comfortable, cared for them as they passed from this life to the next. It was an unheard of ministry in that place, but such, such an important ministry. I gave people dignity in dying. Instead of being unloved, uncared for, abandoned, thrown out, they were loved cared for, looked after, and had dignity as they passed into the next world. I also feel that the greatest tragedy of the COVID pandemic is not the number of people who have died, but the number who have been forced to die alone, isolated from family and friends. That was the case for Yen's dad. He was admitted to hospital with a foot infection and died a week later from causes that are not clear to us, but maybe COVID related. But in all the time that he was in hospital, no family members were allowed to visit with him. He died alone without the comfort of his wife and children by his side as much as they wanted to be there. How did we as a society get to the point that we punish the sick in this cruel way for the sake of the healthy. I personally am ashamed of these edicts imposed by our leaders, but like you, I feel powerless to do anything about them. Jesus knows how it feels to die alone as that seemingly inseparable bond with his father was torn asunder. That intimate relationship was abandoned that which provided strength, comfort, support, love and counsel was withdrawn from him. It was the greatest tragedy of his death. But like our sins, he has taken that loneliness away too. When he took our sins upon himself, he not only suffered separation from his father, but he totally identified with each of us. He stood in the gap for us took our side and paid the ultimate price for our sin. His death opened the way for our life, a life where we also can enjoy intimate fellowship with our Heavenly Father. 
and we are never alone while he holds us in his arms, while his spirit resides in our being. We need to foster, strengthen that relationship so that no matter our circumstances, we will know that we will never be alone and our death is merely a passage to an eternal reunion. Jesus knew that his what sorry Jesus knew what his death would involve. He knew the price that had to be paid. It's no wonder that he sweated drops of blood in Gethsemane. Fading away. The older I get, the more I seem to rely on routine. Having everything in the right place, going through the same procedures each morning ensures that I don't misplace something, forget to bring my wallet, forget to wear my watch. Routines are key to taking my medication. The red one three times per day, the white one at night, the yellow one half a tablet each morning. Thanks to routine, if I walk out the door in the morning and feel a little bit light, I check, I, uh, lighter than usual, I, I, I know something's wrong. I check and sure enough, I've left my keys behind. Thus, I find routines are essential. In fact, they're a great blessing in my older years. But they can also become an obstacle. I can start to resent anything that disrupts my routine. An unexpected visitor, an untimely phone call, misplaced nail cutters, my favourite shoes that have worn a hole in them. Nearly anything can create a reaction of stress and anxiety. There is a danger that, as I grow older, I will become more and more entrenched in my ways and less open to what is happening to, in the world around me. Each day will simply be a repeat of each other day. I will shy away from contact with people, especially those I'm unfamiliar with. I will guard my routines jealously and will resist any interruptions. I will spend my last months and years focused entirely on myself, contributing nothing whatever to the community around me, and I will quietly fade away. I am fearful that this is a possibility for my future. To prevent this, I do not necessarily need to abandon my routines, but I do need to expand them. I need to allow time in my scheduled life to meet with people, to share God's blessings and grace in my life, to provide a word of encouragement, to share the things that I have, to use the experience and talent that God has endowed me with for the good of others. In other words, I need to focus on the fruit of the Spirit, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. My routine needs to include a daily time with God and time reading the scriptures. I need to ask God each day what task he has for me, who he wants me to reach out to, what venture are we going to undertake together this day? Each day will be a day of new achievements. They may be seemingly insignificant tasks, such as greeting a neighbour, smiling to a passerby, offering help to someone. Anything I do in response to God's prompting will be considered as a great achievement in the kingdom of heaven. And my life will not simply fade away, but will be meaningful and satisfying to the very last. And my last topic today, accepting death. Death is very much a reality of life. If God decides it's time to take me from this world, I'm accepting of that. I'm grateful for the rich and incredible experience that he has blessed me with. I have regrets, who doesn't? But overall, I feel mightily blessed. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm trusting God to be there with us 
as Jen and I move into our twilight years. The thing is, death is not the end. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, where, O death, is your sting? Sorry, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death is inevitable for every one of us, but it's not the end. It is our passage to everlasting life in heaven with our creator and loving father. It is the culmination of God's plan for our life. It is the gateway to our ultimate destiny. John 14, we read, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And Revelation 21 then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. We really have much to look forward to beyond the grave, but, but our work here is not yet done. Hebrews chapter 12. So let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So just to summarise, we are all destined to die, but the measure is not our death, but how we live our life. We may face pain in death, but our loving Father promises that he will provide the strength and grace for us to embrace that pain. Circumstances may mean that we are isolated and lonely at our death, but we are never alone if our relationship with God is strong. But let us do whatever we can to prevent another person from dying alone, unloved, uncared for. God has a purpose for each of our lives and we continue to work that out with him to the very last breath of life itself. As Pastor Malcolm likes to say, there's no retirement in the kingdom of God. There is a gracious kingdom that awaits us. Death is simply the gateway to a glorious new life in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our lives, the blessings we enjoy in each of them. We thank you for the relationships, our family, our friends, our colleagues, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the experiences you give us. Lord, we know that our life will end at some stage, but you will call us home. Lord, give us courage to face that day. Help us, Lord, to live an honourable life and a gracious death. Lord, we're looking forward to spending eternity with you. Thank you, Lord.
Christ our Lord. Amen.